are coming to the conclusion, we're not going to wrap up today, but we're coming to the conclusion of our, our study that we've been going through called Changed into His Image. It's all about sanctification. It's all about the process of our becoming more like Christ between the time when we trust Him as our personal Savior and the time when we are with Him in glory and we're looking into His eyes. We began our study some weeks ago by looking at the wickedness of the flesh and the need to mortify the flesh. We get we we kind of use Ephesians four as our as our text as we've been going through here. There's uh, there's our flesh, our old man, the old nature has lots of words that it's it's called in scripture. It needs to be mortified. It needs to be it needs to be done away with. So that we can focus, so that we can receive our, our cues, as it were, from the Holy Spirit and, and will, who will guide us into all truth. So our flesh needs to be mortified. We dealt with that. Then we move forward. It kind of progress to the fact that we need to have our minds renewed. So we mortify the flesh. We renew the mind. How do we renew the mind? Well, through God's word. We've talked about being changed by beholding the glory of God. When Moses was up on the mountain, he came down. He had been in the presence of God. And his, the, the skin of his face shone. Being in the presence of God changed him. So much so that he had to wear a veil over his face because people couldn't handle looking at it. It was too frightening. And, and it won't be the same way. It's not that if you, spend, uh, if you spend a lot of time in your Bible, you'll start glowing. That's not how it works, thankfully. Right? That would be a little, little bit of a social liability. But uh, it's, it's as you behold God in his word, we will become more like him. We will be changed by his glory. Because the simple fact is, is that we become like those who we spend the most time with. If we are spending time in God's word, if we're beholding him and his word, our minds will be renewed. And then last week, we introduce kind of the final stage of sanctification, which is reflecting Christ to the world around us. We want to make a difference. We want to have an impact. We want to help others in their walk towards Christ's likeness. It's important the order that we're talking about here. It's very, very important that your walk with Christ and my walk with Christ be in line before I try to go help others get Get all of their ducks in a row, as it were. You've, you've had somebody come to you, and they, they want to help you, and, and you've looked at them, and you say, but, but you don't have this together. You, you're not in a position to help me because you're still working on you. The concept is found in Matthew where he talks about how, how do you go and help your brother who has a speck in his eye when you have a beam in your own? We need to take care of that. The, the order is significant. We need to mortify the flesh. We need to have our minds renewed. We need to be made into the image of Christ so that we can help others. The order is important. Last week we looked at Matthew 5, 13 through, 15, or 13 through 16. That's the passage about salt and light. It says, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and, and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The purpose of salt is to be tasted. The purpose of light is to be seen. We, and this is talking to believers, we, the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, we are salt. We are light. Let's talk about the impact that we're making. This is not talking about trying to be spiritually mature so that others will think more of us, so that we can exalt ourselves. It's, it's not so that folks will look at us and say, well, that's a, that's a particularly bright light. Wow, look at that person. Or, or wow, look at that person and how they, are, uh, how they walk with God. That's not the point. Our point is not to build ourselves up, 
but to point others towards Christ. This is a call to the type of Christianity that doesn't just affect you, but those around you. <clears throat> so let's talk about how to make a difference. How to, how to be a difference maker in the world that we live in. Do you see anything wrong with society around you? <laughs> we don't have enough time, right, to, to list all of the things we see wrong. Do you see anything, and, and you don't need to nod your heads, but all of us are aware. You've got personal situations where there's, there's someone in your life, maybe they're a, a believer, maybe it's a family member, and they're, they're, they just seem misguided right now. And you want to come alongside, you want to help them, you want to help to, to, to steer them towards Christ. That's good. How do we do it? How, do, how can you have a, an impact on the world around you? How can you make a difference? Let me give you two phrases uh, two quotes that he has in the book here. He says, you have to be different to make a difference. You can't change anything by adding more of the same. That seems incredibly obvious, doesn't it? Very obvious. But how many people, I, I come to you and I say, hey, this 2025 is going to be the year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose weight. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to do all these things. You say, okay, what are you going to do? What do you mean? What am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to get in shape, and I'm, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to lose weight. Well, how are you going to How are you going to change? What are you going to do differently? I said, I'm not going to do anything differently. I just think this is my year. It's going to happen this year. Something about the Something about turning the calendar is going to make the make the pounds fall. That's not how it works. If you want to lose weight, you have to you have to eat less. You have to exercise more. Right? There's there are differences that have to be made. Deb and I have had an ongoing issue with tea here over the last couple of days up here at the, the luncheons that we've had. She likes unsweet tea. Some of, some of you like unsweet tea. I don't understand you. Maybe you can, you can try to, to bring me in. I, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I grew up in, I, I was born in the South where the tea is supposed to be sweet enough that if you run out of syrup, you can pour it on your pan. Right? I want a sludge of, of sugar on the bottom of my tea. That's just kind of kind of the way I like it. But if I get an unsweet tea, if the terrible misfortune should arise that I find myself holding a glass of unsweet tea, what do I have to do to make it acceptable? I have to add something to it. I can't say, I, I can't hold it and say, be sweet. That's not, that's not how it works. I've tried, right? It doesn't work. I have to add something to it that is from outside. Something has to be added to it. To go back to our biblical mandate, if a woman in Israel in the time of Christ wanted to preserve a piece of meat, what did she need to do? She couldn't throw it in the refrigerator. She had to add salt, right? You, I'm going to have to preserve this because salt has a preserving quality to it. So I'm going, to, I'm going to rub it with salt. I'm going to pack it in salt. If you go outside at night, you lost your keys in the backyard, you're going to have to take something with you because you're not sufficient to find your keys in the dark. You have to take light. We are, as the church, as the body of Christ, as believers, we are salt. We are light. And the greatest spiritual impact that will be made upon the world will be made by those who are different from the world. If you want to impact society for Christ, you can't be just like society. Because if you come alongside of somebody, you say, hey, hey, you, let me tell you about Jesus. And they look at you and they say, but you're just like me. Why do I need your Jesus? Why would, I, why would I saddle myself with, with all of those restrictions? Because that's how many people look at Christianity. They say, well, it's just this long list of do's and don'ts. Why would I, why would I put all of that upon myself when I'm, I'm just as good as you are? You, you ever have that happen? The difference is going to be made. The change is going to be made by those who are different from the world. Through Moses, God gave instructions for the leaders of Israel, especially the fathers. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, 
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Then, uh, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. We're going to talk about this in a few moments. What we just read sounds fanatical, doesn't it? You know, I'm supposed to talk about these things all the time. I'm supposed to talk about them when I sit down, when I rise up, when I lay down. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to constantly have these, these truths coming out of me? Yes. I'm, supposed, I'm a father. I'm supposed to be teaching them to my children. I'm supposed to be teaching them a personal love for the Lord. Spiritual leadership, which is what we're talking about. We're talking about being a difference maker. We're talking about having an impact. That is spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership is passing along the lessons that you've learned to those who come behind you. It's refusing to forget the Lord and all of his, all of his benefits, all of his blessings. There are entire psalms written. If you read the entire book of Deuteronomy... There are many times when Moses would say to the children of Israel, or David would say to the children of Israel, hey, you need to remember. You can't forget all that God's done. Because what if, if one generation doesn't pass along to the coming up generation, the goodness of God, what is that up and coming generation going to do? Well, if you look around, you'll see what that generation will do. We're seeing it today. They, they just set it aside. What God? <laughs> what, what was important? What was a keystone to one generation? Well, God's been so good to me. God's done all of this. And, and it's amazing how by the time you get to the grandkids, sometimes they've forgotten about how good God is. Because it wasn't passed down and passed down and passed down. Scripture is that story. Scripture is the story of how one generation experienced the goodness of God. The next generation appreciated it, but didn't pass it on. And the, the next generation, they forsook, for, forsook it entirely. Your impact upon others will directly reflect your passion for the Lord. Because we tell people about what we believe in. I don't know if it's even still possible. We used to pick on my grandfather, uh, my dad's dad. We used to pick on him because he would become a dealer for everything. Whenever he would, if he took a supplement and he really liked it, or if he bought a grill and he really liked it, or if he, if he had a hat that he particularly found comfortable, he would figure out a way to get involved with the company, and then he would be talking about people. So whenever we would go to my grandfather's house, he would, he would have this, he, he had a, one of those, the RO water filters under his sink, and guess what he was now selling? He was selling RO water filters because he had it, he liked it, and he thought, I'm going to tell other people about it, because we tell people about what we believe in, don't we? You say, well, I don't do that. No, but we do talk about what's on our heart. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said, what you love and what you hate reveal what you are. Right? What you love and what you hate reveal what you are. We don't worry about what doesn't matter to us. Somebody said anxiety reveals priorities. There are some things that I genuinely do not care about. But there are some things that they, they take up an awful big part. I have my wife, Stephanie. I have my three daughters, Audrey, Sabrina, and Natasha. They, they are a big part of my thought process. And, and if I was going to worry, boy, that, that, would, that would be something. I, when, when, I'm not, when I'm sitting in my office and the house gets real quiet, if you've had small children around, you know what that's like. That's nice. And then the longer you think about it, you think, Something's burning, or they're digging a hole somewhere. Something's happening in the house, and and I'll 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 start worrying, and I'll call my wife. I'll, I'll say, "Honey, where are the where are the girls?" Well, I don't know. And then what do we do? 
where are the girls? So we're out there, we're looking, we call, we have a bell on the side of the house, we ring the bell, where are the girls? And they'll come, many, most of the time, they'll come out of the barn and they've been in there playing with the dog or something, it's, it's, it, they're not doing anything, but, but our anxiety reveals our priorities. We don't worry about what doesn't matter to us. If you determine a man's worries, you've discovered his treasure. What we use our resources on is another indicator of our priorities. Where we, where we put uh, our treasure. Uh, uh, Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Time is a resource. Where we spend it or, or our preoccupation also reveals our priorities. What angers us? is another tell of what matters most to us. Every man is passionate about something. That's a, that's a fact. Every man, and when I say man, I'm mankind. Every, every person, everybody, is passionate about something. Maybe it's pleasure, or sports, or wardrobe, or solitude, or control, or any number of hobbies. Have you ever known somebody who was fanatical over a sport? Maybe you've known somebody like this. You, their, their heart is invested in every game, right? They're, they're, they're fanatical about it. Their mind is overflowing with stats and, and rosters. They could tell you the weight of the quarterback in the 80s. And they, they know all of these truths about their team. When they cheer, even in front of the TV. It seems they believe that the outcome of the game depends upon their team spirit. Maybe you've been, you've been around somebody like that. I, I see people looking at each other. I'm trying not to make eye contact. I, I know it happens, right? It, it should manifest itself differently. But Jesus said in Mark 12, 30, and he was quoting from Deuteronomy when he said, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. Somebody who's fanatical about their sport, it's easy to see. They've got their heart, their mind, their soul, their strength. They're just, they're all in. It should be so, again, it will manifest itself differently. <laughs> don't, don't Gatorade on me after a message, okay? But <laughs> it's, it's going to look differently, but we should have that same dedication. To our God. Because truth be told, there will come a day when nobody will care about the sports. But everyone will care about our Lord. This kind of love sounds extreme. Maybe a, a better name for it would be extravagant love. I'm going to take just a few minutes and we're going to go. Open, open your Bibles to Mark 14. <coughs> Mark 14, and we're going to look at some examples of extravagance that we should that we should emulate from Scripture. We think of extravagance as kind of it's not a good word. You wouldn't want somebody to say, "Well, they're they're just extravagant." Well, I understand, but in all of these cases, in all of these ways, we should be extravagant. Let's look at Mary. Mary is our first. Example of extravagant giving. Extravagant giving. Mark chapter 14, let's look at verse 3. <clears throat> and being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box, a pointment of spikenard, very precious, and she brake the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it, it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. By the way, that's about a year's wage, 300 pence. It could have been sold for 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. There's a parallel passage to this in John 12. And it gives us the identity of this woman. It was Mary of Bethany who we would know her as Mary, the, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus. They lived in Bethany, which is also where Simon the leper lived. John also tells us that the disciple who spoke up, do you remember who it was? 
Judas, Judas Iscariot. It also gives us his reasoning. He wanted the, the money to be given uh, to, to the poor <laughs> because he was the treasurer, and the Bible tells us he kept the bag. So he was skimming off of the top of the, of the purse, as it were. He was taking some of the money to himself. Jesus put Judas in his place in Mark 14, 6. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She had wrought a good work on me. He would go on in the next verses to say, she is, what she's doing, she's doing in preparation for my burial. I, one day I'll preach a whole message on it. But Beth, uh, Mary of Bethany, was one of, she was conspicuously absent from the tomb. I think she's one of the only people prior to the crucifixion of Christ, who actually understood the resurrection. She didn't save her ointment to apply to the dead body of Christ because she knew he wouldn't be in the tomb that long. She applied her ointment to Christ while he was living. And then on the morning of the, of the resurrection, there were a lot of Marys at the tomb, but Mary of Bethany was not among them, I believe, because she understood. But the gift that Mary gave was extravagant. Extravagant gifts are a sign of love. A quote here, the gifts of lovers are often misunderstood by others. Lovers often appear to overdo it. That's what Judas was thinking. Now, if Mary had come in, and, and let's say that the, the ointment that she was going to offer was just a few shekels. It was, it was a little bit. It was almost a sampler, right? It wasn't much. I bet Judas wouldn't have had an issue with it. I bet Judas would have said, well, whatever. What, whatever. That's, if that's what she wants to do with her, with her time, with her money, go, go for it. But it was extravagant. We know Judas had no love for Christ. Judas would betray Christ. He misunderstood this gift. There are actually two incidents in the life of Jesus in which a woman poured ointment on him. Interestingly enough, they both took place in the house of men named Simon, but they were in different places in Israel and at totally different times. They were one was early on in his in his ministry, one was just before he would go to the cross. The woman in the first instant, instance is not named, but we know her from from the passage she had been a harlot Jesus had been eating in the home of a Pharisee, again named Simon. And when Jesus was sitting there and this woman who had been, she was a woman of ill repute. She came in and she, she breaks this, this bottle. It was usually a long-necked bottle and it had the ointment at the bottom. And it was a one use. You would break the bottle open and there was no sealing it back up. So she opened it, broke it, and she began to pour it on Jesus. And the, the Pharisee who was there, he... He didn't say anything. He just looked at Jesus and he thought, there's no way this man can be the Messiah because he'd know what kind of a woman this is and he wouldn't allow it. Jesus rebuked his host. He forgave the woman and he sent her on her way after she had given her extravagant gift. She had experienced extravagant forgiveness. So no other gift but an extravagant one would be appropriate in return. She'd received much. It just makes sense that she would give much. Does our love for Christ reflect the great forgiveness that we've been shown? We just sang, when I survey the wondrous cross. The last verse says... Were the whole realm of nature mine. If I owned everything there is, that were a present far too small. If I could give him everything there is, that wouldn't be enough. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Another hymn that's in our hymnal is, I gave my life for thee, and it asks a question. One of the verses says, I gave my life for thee. This is, it would be from the perspective of Christ. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom thee and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. 
What hast thou done for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou done for me? What would help our love for Christ to be rekindled? Maybe as we sit here, and when we talk about giving, when giving comes up in a church, many times the first thought, oh, we're talking about money. No. Money is part of it. Again, money, where we spend our resources reveals our priorities. But there's more that we can give than just our money. We can give our time. Somebody said time is money, right? You, you only have a limit. You can make more money. You can't make more time. We can give our time. We have, we have talents that we've been given. You have abilities. I have abilities. Am I willing to give them wholly to the Lord? Am I willing to give my, my all? What would help this love? If maybe as we sit here, we'd say, you know what? You're right. My love, it's the, the fire of my love has gotten small. It's, it's still there, it's, it's, but it's embers. It's not, it's not a flame like it should be. What would help to rekindle our love for Christ? Looking at him. Getting in his word. You and I, we need to spend time beholding him in his word. As we behold his glory, as we said earlier, will be changed. We saw Mary's extravagant gift. Let's look at another instance with Mary. Let's look at her extravagant attention, another thing that she, she gave. Luke 10, 38 begins another account of Mary of Bethany. Mary lived with her sister Martha and her brother Lazarus. And there came a day when Jesus was coming over for a meal with his disciples. Uh, I, I remember when I was little, my mom would occasionally, she would say, Ben, I want you to clean your room. And I would go clean my room, as it were. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't the best cleaning. There was a lot of stuff that would go under the bed. It, perhaps you were taking your life in your own hands if you were to open the closet. It, it's, it's possible. That may be how it was. But my mom would say, Ben, I want you to go clean your room, and I want you to clean it. And in those days, she said, I want you to clean it like the president was coming over for dinner, and he was going to tour your room. And that meant something to me, so I'd go in there, and I would push things further under the bed. And I would make sure that it wouldn't fall out of the closet if you opened it. I, I, I would clean my room, and sometimes I would go all the way. But I want you to think about it. Jesus is coming over for a meal. And, and you can imagine, ladies, if, if Jesus were coming to your house, and I let's say I gave you three days' notice, what would you spend the next three days doing if Jesus was coming? Your house would become sterile. You would be able to perform surgery on the coffee table. It would be so clean. And, and that's what Martha was all about. Martha was getting it clean. She's busy with housework. Preparations, understandably so. And where was Mary? You know the story. Martha's cleaning. Jesus is there. She's getting the meal ready. Where was, where was Mary? She's sitting at Jesus' feet. Look at verse 40 of Luke 10. It says, But Martha was cumbered about with much serving. That cumbered about, that word means distracted. She was preoccupied. She was too busy about something. <laughs> Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Martha was so caught up in her business that she came and attempted to set Jesus straight. <laughs> she was caught up in the moment. And again, at we can fault Martha because there's fault. But at the same time, Jesus was coming over for dinner. So I'll, I'm willing to cut her a fair amount of slack because she's got a lot going on. She goes in. She tries to set Jesus straight. Martha felt that Mary was overdoing it with the undivided attention that she was paying her Lord. Lord... Mary's in here, and the kitchen's in there, and there's stuff to do in the kitchen. Lord, send her in here. She's been in, she's been in here with you long enough. 
the attention that is given by one who loves another will often appear extravagant. That attention, that undivided attention. I want you to listen to David describe how he felt about the Lord. I'm going to read. It's on, I'll put it on the screen as well. Psalm 63, verse 1. Listen to this. See if you pick up on, on an extravagance in, his, in the time he's willing to spend. He says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. So David, he says, early will I seek thee. He's, he's up early and he's seeking after the Lord. Throughout the day, he's lifting up his, his hands in praise to God. And what is he doing as he goes to bed and as he lays in bed? He's continually meditating on the Lord. Is David laying it on a bit thick here? Would, would we say, well, David, you're right. We, we get it. You love, you love the Lord. But you're, you're being a bit fanatical here, honestly. Is there nothing else in your life? He's setting us an example of extravagant love revealed in the attention to the object of that love. While we're talking about David, we see his, his attention. We see Mary's attention. Let's talk about David's praise. We, we, kind of, we can use Psalm 63 as a springboard. He says, my lips shall praise thee. David spent a great deal of time in his early life out in the field, keeping his father's sheep, so he had lots of time to think. In that time, we know that David wrote many of the psalms that we have in Scripture. He's called the sweet psalmist of Israel. We have lots of his thoughts that he had while he was sitting. David loved his Lord, and it, it shows up in his psalms of praise. Psalm 113 through Psalm 118 are all considered they would be called the Hallel Psalms. Hallel meaning praise. That's Those Psalms, that's all they are. Those were the Psalms that the children of Israel would say as they were walking up to the temple. They would, they would kind of collectively recite the Hallel Psalms. And, and there are lots of those, not just Psalm 113 to 118. We could turn to many of them. Let me read you just a couple verses from Psalm 145. See if you pick up on, on extravagant praise. See if you pick up on somebody who's, this man is serious about his love. He's serious about his praise. Listen to this. He says, I will extol thee, my God, O King. I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee. I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts and I will declare thy greatness. I go through weeks of my life without using the phrase forever and ever. I don't, I don't describe things that way, but David uses it several times right here in a row. What's he describing? He's saying, look, I, I'm going to praise him forever and ever, and I still won't get the job done. When David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, after decades of it having been in another place, some thought he went overboard with his praise, specifically his wife, Michael. 2 Samuel 6.13 says, And it was so that when they bare the ark of the Lord, when they that had bare the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he offered oxen and fat legs. <coughs> six paces? I would have to take much more than six paces to get out of this room. 
And every time the Levites who are bearing the Ark of the Covenant, every time they take six steps, they stop. And then they bring out more sacrifices and they, they offer these sacrifices right there on the spot. And, and they, have the, they have a party. And then six steps more. Here comes another batch of sacrifices. How long would it take? A long time. Why would you do this? Why would you go to this, this great length? Oh, because of great love that reveals itself in extravagant praise. Verse 14 says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with the linen ephod. So David... And all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. Here's where it goes off. Here's where, here's where his wife, Michael, thought he, he went too far. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw David, saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They had a conversation. For sake of time, we won't, we won't read the whole thing. David came before Michael, and she, she basically told him, you overdid it today. That was a bit much, David. That, that was laying it on a bit thick, don't you think? You made a fool out of yourself dancing out there in front of the ark as it comes. Oh, what, what is your problem? And David said, no, no, I didn't do enough. How many, how many animal sacrifices were made? We don't even know. Every six steps. It takes a long way. The, up, the, up that mountain in Jerusalem is a lot of steps. It would have taken a lot. He was extravagant. He was, he was overboard, some would say. But genuine love is like that. Genuine love is extravagant. Now, our love for Christ is not going to reveal itself in animal sacrifice. Our love for Christ is not going to, to reveal it. We don't have the Ark of the Covenant that we can dance before as it goes up to Jerusalem. We don't have that. How is our love for Christ going to be shown? How is it going to be revealed? Well, it's going to be revealed by extravagant giving. Not just of, of our resources, but of our time, of our talents. It's going to reveal itself in extravagant praise. It's going to reveal itself in extravagant, single-minded focus and attention. How, how's your love for Christ today? I, I ask you to evaluate it yourself. What's it like? Would you say that you're distracted when it comes to Christ? You say, well, yeah, no, I love Christ, and I believe you. I love Christ, but I'm distracted. I got all these other things going on. I, 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 I don't take the time that I should. Hey, then, then fix that. You and I, we want to make a difference, right? Well, our goal in this whole process of becoming more like Christ, we want to do that because it brings glory to him. We also want to do it so that we can help others. If you and I want to help others, we need to be extravagant in our giving, in our praise, in our attention. We need to, we need to have a love for Christ that shows up on the outside. It's easy for us to say, well, yeah, I love Jesus. If I was to ask for a raise of hands, how many of you love Jesus? Every hand would go up without question. Does it show up? Can, can your love for Christ be seen? Does your love for Christ present such a difference that it would, that it would push others to say, boy, if, if they're that if they're that crazy about their Savior, if they're that extravagant about Christ, maybe I should find out a little bit more about it. Maybe I should, maybe I should find out what all there is to this relationship that they have. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer here? <coughs> Our Father, we thank you for your word and for the examples that it contains. Lord, our goal is to be made like you. Lord, because you're worthy, you bought us a great price, and you're worthy of our, our dedication. But Lord, we also want to have an impact. We want to, we want to be used to change others to be more like you. I pray that we would be different. I pray that our difference would show up 
in our extravagant love, our extravagant attention, our extravagant giving, and extravagant praise. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we seek to serve you in this way. I pray that you would just receive all the honor and glory from our lives. Be with us now as we prepare to go into the, the morning service. I pray that you would be honored and exalted there as well. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Here it is next.